Hello everybody and welcome to the second part of this video. My name is Andrew Menzies and I'm a senior application scientist here at Brooko Nano Analytics in Berlin. This video uh, will show how to post-process your data collected. In this case, it's a micro XRF uh, elemental map collected over a sample with inside an SEM. And the post-processing post will include how to look at the data and how to process this data to extract relevant information about your sample. As is always the case, if you have information about your sample beforehand, that will help in the post-processing to identify the elements and or other phases in your sample, and I'll cover some of this shortly. As you can see here on the screen, on the left is a secondary electron image from the sample that was collected in the SEM, and on the right here is the elemental data that was saved when the sample was processed or collected, and we will now look at this data and edit it. You can see down the bottom various elemental individual elements, and I'll go through this uh, to show how these were identified, as well as look at the potential for other elements in the sample. So the first step is to look at this data. If we click on spectrum, we can now zoom into the spectra, and let me create a slightly bigger image, where we can start looking at the individual peaks. The first thing from a quality control point of view is that we wish to make sure that the identified peaks are in the middle of the spectra. And in this case, the energy calibration looks correct. We can see that the peak for various elements is in the middle of the peaks identified. And this is correct for an energy for the calibration of the actual EDS detector. If there was an offset, then that would mean the detector would need to be recalibrated. However, it would still be possible to correct this data so that it could be investigated and used. The next step is to identify the peaks in your sample, the various elements potentially in your sample. I have pre-selected these elements here, which are common in silicate rocks, especially granitic rocks. We can see here elements such as aluminium and silica. And if I go back to the spectra, we can see that these are very easily identifiable and large peaks. There are other elements such as potassium, calcium, a minor amount of titanium, but that is expected, as well as manganese and iron. An element not expected in uh, a granitic rock is copper. And this copper here, if we go back to the map, this is in relation to the copper tape here that is visible in the uh, SE image here. Now that was just for the conductive uh, purposes of the sample being coated for when we're using the electron beam. However, it should be noted that the sample for micro XRF analysis did not need to actually be carbon coated. The data could have been collected with the micro XRF. So normally this copper tape would be put nicely at the edge if the sample is carbon coated and we wish to do e-beam investigation as well simultaneously or independently. So we can see here this copper is overprinting some of the actual sample. Next, we can go back to the actual uh, spectrum and we can see that there are many unidentified peaks. So for the first part, we'll look at these high energy peaks. Now, this is a region not normally associated with uh, E-beam analysis. These high energies are unlikely to be identified as they are uh, beyond the range of the, the KV employed for the electron beam analysis. So this normally relates to elements such as rubidium, strontium, yttrium, zirconium, niobium, and molybdenum. And we can see here to a greater or lesser extent, we have uh, some of these elements in our sample. Additionally, these elements are likely to be at low levels, minor or possibly trace levels. And this also would make it difficult for an e-beam to detect these elements. If we go back to the mapping area now, we can see as the data loads up, and we'll pause and wait for that to finish. So now that the sample has reprocessed for these elements, we can see if we select yttrium and or zirconium, we get a map of the presence of these elements. We can see that the yttrium is associated with certain large uh, minerals, 
whereas the zirconium is present in small grains. We can investigate where these samples may lie or where these elements may lie in the sample. If we zoom in and we select down here an area where we can identify small grains, we can select a subset of the hypermap, in this case object one. And now if I go to spectrum, we can definitely see here the green map. So I'll turn off the XRF map and we see clearly the presence of yttrium and in this case, niobium. And that is associated with a calcium titanium phase. And we also see that it has silica in there as well. So those are the major elements associated with these two minor trace elements. If we look at some of the zircon zirconium grains, so these are very small. And if we can find one here that we will highlight. If we go back to the spectrum here, and now we just show this one here, we can see down at the zirconium end, a very strong zirconium peak and the secondary K-beta peak. And this is associated, we see here, with a calcium peak as well and some silica here. So this is likely to be from the mineral zircon. And now I have reloaded the sample data set again to show the difference between processing of elemental data to get some phase information. That is phases or minerals that might be present in your sample. In this case, I know that it's a granitic sample, so I have certain expectations of the mineral phases present. And we could see we should get something similar to this image already shown on the screen, which represents the overlay of different elements. And as likely each one of those different merged colors represents a different mineral species. Down below, I have selected, selected these elements, including copper, even though it is not one of the minerals present in the sample, it is present in the data set. And so now if I go to phases and I use the automatic setting for clusters, and we can see what happens if I use these elements to identify the different phases, these major elements in the sample. And here we see we get a map that looks very similar to the element, elemental map shown before, especially when combined. However, now we can see this is represented as different phases. So we see phase one, phase two, phase three, etc. And this is shown in an order of increasing uh, abundance. If I select just phase one, I can now go over here on the right and select the spectrum button. And this will show me a combined spectrum of all this information classified as phase one. And we see here in the spectrum, just selecting phase one, this is the red spectra, I'll turn off the map. And we can see here that if we zoom in, we see that it is a potassium silicate. So this likely represents a potassium feldspar. If now we go back and select the second phase, phase two, and create a spectrum of that grouping of minerals or grouping of elements, we see in the spectrum now the green spectra and this is now a calcium silica, alumina silicate, likely representing a calcic feldspar. And this can continue if we now select the third phase, i.e. represented in blue here. And we see here the blue spectra is now essentially a silica phase, i.e. representing quartz. So we see those are the three major mineral phases likely present in a granite, that is a potassium and a calcium bearing feldspar and uh, quartz. We also see there are likely to be other phases and we can go through and identify those continuously, likely to represent minerals such as mica, uh, oxides or uh, amphibole silicates, possi possibly titanium bearing uh, oxides as well. So, in summary, here is a results comparison between the Micro XRF and eBeam hypermaps. In this slide are the two hypermaps with the Micro XRF dataset on the left and the eBeam on the right. As indicated, the following five elements are shown, namely aluminium in cyan, silicon in red, potassium in green, calcium in blue, and iron in brown.
The color overlaps of these elements highlights the various minerals present in the granite, for example, quartz, plagioclase, potassium feldspar, amongst others. It is apparent that the two hypermaps yield very similar results, although the E-beam hypermap has a sharper image due to the higher resolution, that is, the smaller spot size. The micro XRF has a spot size of around 30 microns. However, there are some important differences between the two hypermaps. Firstly, the micro XRF has a different excitation range and signal intensity to the E-beam. Here we see the total spectrum for the micro XRF in blue on the left and for the E-beam in red on the right. Thus, whilst the major elements in the sample, e.g. aluminium, silicon, potassium, calcium and iron, show distinct peaks for both data sets, as shown here for the 0 to 10 keV range, the micro XRF data set has information for elements at higher keVs, as well as a lower limit of detection. This is apparent when looking at the 10 to 20 keV range, as shown here by the orange box. Zooming into this region, we note the distinctive peaks of rubidium, strontium, yttrium, zirconium, niobium, and molybdenum, which are absent from the E-beam total spectrum map on the right. Looking at the spatial location of some of these elements, it is apparent that they occur within distinct mineral phases in the granite. If specific areas are selected that represent these mineral phases, the presence of these trace elements of interest is confirmed, as shown by the various arrows linking grains with the spectral peaks on the right. Furthermore, it is possible to look at the maximum pixel spectrum and identify other elements that may not be obvious in the total spectrum. In this case, the presence of elements such as uranium, thorium, cerium, neodymium, and lanthanum have been identified in the granite. And so to summarize what we have shown in this video today, the introduction of a micro XRF on the SEM will create a dual beam system. So in total, you'll have two sources, an electron beam, and a micro XRF X-ray beam. However, they will still only necessitate the one detector, the one energy dispersive spectrometer. In addition, there are two stages, the SEM stage and the rapid stage. The rapid stage is important as this enables high speed scanning to be done when using the X-ray beam, remembering that the X-ray beam is fixed in space and cannot ruster like an E-beam. So what are some of the benefits of the micro XRF in the rapid stage? While the micro XRF enables lower detection limits, this can be down to 10 ppm for certain elements, allows the detection of high energy X-ray lines, so there is a full spectrum range up to 40 keV. You can do micrometer scale measurement over a large area, and it is also ideal for low keV or beam sensitive samples. This is especially because there are no charging effects, so there is minimal sample preparation required. In addition, there is fast elemental X-ray mapping over large areas. And this will show the major, minor, and also trace elements on a PPM scale.